Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Those were the words of John the Baptist. The one who was prophesied would come before the Lord Jesus Christ, would come before the Messiah came onto the scene, paved the way before him, forerunner. So when the Lord Jesus Christ came to be baptised in the river Jordan, John the Baptist signifying the Lord Jesus Christ said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now John the Baptist was a man who walked with God. A man who was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. And in the Spirit he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, had a sacrificial system. There was a, there was a way to atone for sin. And it was through the sacrifice of an animal. A man could take a lamb, a lamb without spot and blemish. They could bring it to the priest. And this lamb, being sacrificed on the altar, could atone for the sin of that guilty person. So when Jesus of Nazareth came to be baptised by John, John was speaking in regards to the sacrifice that the Messiah would make to atone for the sins, not just of him or of this individual or that individual, and not just the sins of the people of Israel, but for the sins of the whole world. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Now for 2,000 years now, both Jews and Gentiles, both Jews and non-Jews, have been believing on Jesus of Nazareth to be that promised Messiah, to be the one who would take away their sins. So men and women from all walks of life, through all nations, through all tribes, have been believing on Jesus of Nazareth, have been believing on Jesus Christ, so that their sins could be forgiven, so that their sins could be pardoned. Now I'm here today to declare to you, to declare to each and every one of you that this Jesus of Nazareth, He is the Saviour of the world. He is the Lamb of God. And it's only through faith in Him can your sins be pardoned. It's only through faith in Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Lamb of God, can your sins be atoned for? Can you be forgiven? Can you be cleansed of your sin? So Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, He laid down His life. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, he laid down his life. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Now we see signs of this crucifixion wherever we go. Here we have this old Minster building built for the worship of God, built for the worship of Christ. And as I look through this arch, I see there the cross. And as I look behind me on this market cross, we see at the top there again a cross. So we see the image of the cross. Wherever we go, and now I know, I know that you guys who live here in this town uh, will, will, will like this old Minster building. It adds character to your town. And I know that you would love this Market Cross because it, it's part and parcel with this town centre. But the symbols are all over, the symbol of the cross here and above me but the cross the cross was a way in which the old Roman government would would execute criminals now the Lord Jesus Christ who had done no wrong done no evil he was condemned to, to death and he was impaled to one of these Roman crosses. Now this was the way, this was the way in which the living God was going to deal with our sin. Because mankind had rebelled against him, had sinned against him, had broken his law, they deserve to be punished. And the punishment for sin against God, the punishment for sin against an eternal God was an eternal death, an eternal separation from God in hell. But God, who is rich in mercy, who is an abundant in grace, in kindness he made a way there was a rescue plan God had a rescue plan for humanity that he would make a way for sinful men and women to be able to have their sins forgiven pardoned and reconciled to him and brought into his kingdom You see, that right at the beginning, when you read the Holy Bible, when you open up the Holy Bible, and you read there, even in those first three small chapters, you see, you see the rescue plan of God taking shape. God spoke. God spoke to the devil after he had deceived Eve and said I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed he will crush you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel so there was a promise there a promise there right at the beginning men and women right at the beginning there men and women of food the promise of a redeemer the promise of one who would be born of the woman and we see there don't we the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Son of God who is the seed of the woman. He is a descendant of Adam. He is a descendant of Abraham. He is a descendant of David. 
He was born into this world by a woman, born under the law, Mary, Miriam, the Virgin, in which the eternal word, the eternal word, the eternal Son would be born into this world through that chosen vessel, Mary, a great holy Jewish lady. And Christ was born. Christ was born. He was born into this world. Perfect. And he lived sinless. And he did good. And he preached the truth. And he healed the sick. And he drove out the devils. He raised the dead. And he cleansed lepers. If you were fortunate enough to meet with Jesus, you met with somebody who was was righteous and holy, full of love, full of kindness and grace. The greatest man who has ever walked upon the face of this earth. And this was the one, this was the one who would atone for our sin. This was the one who would give up his life upon the cross of Calvary for us. He is the one who is the sin bearer. Men and women of God. He would bear the sin of many. He would bear our sins in his own body. Our sins he would take on himself. And he would die the death that you deserve. For your transgressions. For your sins. Whatever they may be. Your lying. Your stealing, your sex outside of marriage, whatever it is, your adultery, your murders, your abortion, your unrighteous anger and your violence, your thefts, your idolatries, whatever it is, the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sin and he gave his life. And God raised him up again from the dead. We Christians can lift up the cross in admiration of the fact that our Saviour died for us. And we can lift up the cross knowing that Jesus did not remain there. For Jesus of Nazareth was taken down from that cross. That his body was taken and placed into a tomb, embalmed and wrapped with a shroud, covered and there in the sepulchre lay the body, the dead body of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. And Jesus did not remain dead in that tomb like those who are in their graves there in that churchyard. His body did not remain there because after three days Jesus of Nazareth was lifted up out of that grave. He was raised to everlasting life. He was raised up out of that grave and appeared to men the miraculous power of the almighty God lifting up the sinless saviour Jesus Christ out of the tomb men and women of ghoul up and out of the tomb with the appearance of angels messengers of God speaking and appearing and testifying of the truth You see, it was impossible that the, the tomb could keep hold of the Saviour of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Death could not hold the Son of God. The grave could not grip the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No, 
Up from the grave he rose again. Up from the tomb he rose. Up out of the grave, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, was raised up and appeared to men. Many different men and women, they saw Jesus alive again, glorified. They witnessed it. They saw it. They saw it with their own eyes. How many people saw Jesus of Nazareth alive after his death? They saw this man. They saw him. They saw him nailed to a cross. Do you think that Roman soldiers got it, made mistakes when they took criminals and they nailed them to a cross? Do you think they made mistakes in that taking them down alive again? Jesus' body was so, so broken. Could you imagine having six inch nails through your wrists and through your feet? Could you imagine have been nailed to the cross after you have been treated so badly? Having a crown of thorns sunk into your skull? Having been slapped, having having your beard ripped out? Beaten? Mistreated? having carried that cross to the place of execution and there impaled. No, when Jesus rose from the dead, he walked, he talked, he ate, he drank. Not like a man that had recently been impaled to a cross by Roman soldiers. Not a man that had been in a tomb three days. No, Jesus was dead if you had been able if you had been able to feel the the pulse of Jesus Christ of Nazareth while he was on that cross he was dead dead a bloody death but Jesus of Nazareth having been taken down dead from the cross was placed into a tomb And after three days, he rose up again. Does anybody know that Jesus of Nazareth raised himself from the dead? You see, the Bible says the soul that sin shall die. Did Jesus sin? No. Spotless, blameless. The only man who never walked upon this earth and never sinned. The only person that ever lived and walked upon this earth and been completely and utterly blameless before God. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whoever you are, you may think you're very good, very righteous, but you have broken God's law. You might say, no, not me. I'm that very good person of gold. Let me ask you, have you lied about somebody? Have you ever stolen? Have you ever committed adultery? Have you ever had unrighteous anger? Have you ever been angry with somebody without a true cause to be angry with them? Have you ever engaged in fornication, sex outside of marriage? Do you look at pornography? I hope not. Have you ever been violent? Have you ever been violent to somebody? Took out your anger, struck a person, grabbed a person and shown violence. Have you ever gossiped and slandered? Now in our society, gossip and slandering people behind their backs is just part and parcel of what people do. But 
this is sin. This is sinful. All have sinned. The Bible says you have sinned. Basically, you have sinned. And to sin means to violate the moral law of God. It means to fail to conform to the moral law of God. God is holy and pure and righteous and perfect. And you have not been perfect. You have violated the holy law of God. You find yourself guilty and condemned in the eyes of a holy, righteous God. Deserving, deserving eternal separation from Him. Following judgment but Jesus is the only one who ever lived a sinless life Jesus of Nazareth is the only one who's ever lived his life and did no evil did no wrong no vile word no vile thought no vile deed no sin no transgression no iniquity no guile in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ He's holy and righteous and pure. Always has been, always will be. But you have not. But this Jesus rose from the dead. The cross couldn't keep him. The grave couldn't keep him. Death could not keep him. Jesus of Nazareth rose up again from the dead. He lives forevermore. And he appeared unto men and women. He appeared to them. Did he appear to one person? No. Did he appear to 12 people? No. Over 500 people saw Jesus of Nazareth alive after his death. Over 500 people claim that they saw Jesus of Nazareth alive after his death. And many of these were murdered. Many of these were murdered, men and women. Murdered in different parts of the Roman Empire and beyond, testifying of what they had witnessed and what they had seen. They'd met the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the one in which the prophets had spoken about. And Jewish men and women hear the prophecies when they visit their synagogues and listen to their rabbis. They hear the scriptures being read. They are people who know the holy book and know the prophecies. And they were waiting for the Messiah and the Messiah came. And they followed him and they knew him and they heard him and they saw the things that he did. Jesus prophesied and testified of what would happen before it happened. And they witnessed it and saw it with their own eyes. And they saw the Messiah dead. And they saw him on the cross. And they saw him being buried. And they saw him alive. Glorified. After his death. And as I said... Many of them were martyred, killed, murdered, different parts of the Roman Empire and beyond. Murdered in different ways, hung from trees, buried alive, crucified upside down. Thrown into pots of burning tar. Never denying, they didn't sit there and say, oh sorry, we just made it up, it's just a story. No, they went to their deaths believing and testifying of what they had witnessed and saw. But what about you, men and women of God? What about you? Today, 2,000 years later, are you hearing the same message? What I'm preaching to you today is the message that Jesus Christ said should be preached in all the world. What I'm preaching to you today is the message that the Apostles preached. This is the message that's been received by the world. All the nations, men and women out of all the nations and tribes have believed the Gospel and entered into the Kingdom of God. But what about you? 
There is a kingdom other than the United Kingdom. There is the kingdom of God, worldwide, eternal, that will go on forever and ever and ever. Christ is the king. Are you going to bow your knee to him? Are you going to wave the white flag of surrender? Or in the pride of your heart, are you going to hold on to your sin and say, stop God, I'm going to live my life my way. Trust me. Yes, you have the ability to choose. But the question is this. The question is this. How is it going to work out for you in the end? Today, today is a day of salvation. Today is the day that you're hearing the glad tidings, the good news. Today is the day that God is reaching out to the men and women of God through a preacher, through his child, through his minister, so that you can hear the gospel and that you can respond to it. But you must respond. The Bible said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just because Jesus died and rose again, it doesn't mean that you're pardoned. You must turn to God. You must put your faith, you must put your trust, your confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you put your trust and confidence in many things. You know, you phone a taxi, the taxi turns up, you put your trust in the taxi driver to drive safely to your destination. He takes you to the airport, you put your trust in the baggage handlers that they will handle and manage your baggage. You, you go to the plane, you get on the plane and you trust the pilot that he knows what he's doing, that he can fly your plane, that he'll take you, he'll, he'll, he'll take off and land. You put your trust and confidence in many things. I'm saying to you, you need to put your trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He alone can save you. He alone can save you. So, to sum up, cast off your transgressions and get yourself a new heart. Save yourselves from this perverse generation which is heading for hell. Call upon the name of the Lord that you shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him and believe on him. And he will save you. And he will raise you up on the last day. Come to God. Submit to the king. Enter into the kingdom. And have eternal life. Amen. And amen.